This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Deist, the only podcast dedicated to Austrian economics. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. I'm joined by a guest that doesn't need much of an introduction to most of you, no doubt, Dr. Jeffrey Herbner, obviously a longtime friend and senior fellow at the Mises Institute, also a professor of economics and actually chair of the Department of Economics at Grove City College in Grove City, Pennsylvania. And Jeff, it's been a while, but uh, thanks for joining us. Great to talk to you. Well, thanks for having me on. It's a, it's always a pleasure. Well, we are talking this weekend about the Fed and trying to demystify it a bit and talk about the mechanics. And Dr. Herbner, as you know, it's no great crime for anyone uh, to not understand how the Fed operates mechanically or even conceptually, I would venture that really even the majority of economists don't have a real good sense of how the Fed operates. Uh, It's become almost a niche in economics, in in monetary economics. But um, I wanted to just give our audience a little bit of an Austrian uh, basic course in the Fed this weekend. So maybe we could start, if you could, just give us a brief overview of how the Austrian school views money and the creation of money versus other, you know, nominally free market schools, Chicagoites, monetarists, et cetera. What's, what makes the Austrian perspective on money and banking different? Well, as usual, the Austrians uh, take a causal realist view that so we want to observe the actual process uh, on in money uh, inflation and uh, credit creation. This would be opposed to, say, a monetarist economist who doesn't link these things together but treats economy in a kind of uh, overly aggregated way. <clears throat> so our uh, position is, is simply to uh, look at what the Fed uh, does in practice and how they conduct their, say, an open market operation and the way in which this uh, and their regulatory apparatus over the banks then allows the banks to expand their loan portfolios uh, through the issue of uh, checking account balances. So basic process is that the Fed will uh, buy securities from banks and pay them with reserve balances. And uh, they regulate banks to uh, hold a certain uh, fraction of those reserves against their checking accounts. So if a bank uh, sells a million dollars of securities to the Fed, the uh, bank can then use that million dollars as a reserve and parlay on top of that $1 million reserve, uh, $10 million, let's say, new loans. And they extend these loans to customers by just crediting their checking accounts. But this, I mean, this most recent round of quantitative easing since the 2008 crash, I mean, this is really an unprecedented uh, in terms of volume. In other words, the Fed is... is is creating bank reserves at a pace it never has before. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, before the QE uh, programs began in uh, the fall of uh, 2008, <clears throat> the uh, Fed's balance sheet was about $850 billion. And today it's um, about $4.4 trillion. And, and this represents uh, the acquisition of about $2.5 trillion worth of treasury securities by the Fed and about $1.7 trillion in mortgage-backed securities. Yeah, it's really incredible to think about, but I'm sure a lot of our audience is familiar with these terms, but can you talk a little bit about what the monetary base is, i.e. the Fed's balance sheet, versus the broader money supply itself? Sure. So the monetary base is the, um, the items that the Fed directly controls that uh, are monetary. So it includes the currency that they print, and then it includes uh, bank reserves. <clears throat> so the currency right now is about uh, $1.4 trillion, and the bank reserves are about $2.6 trillion. So the monetary base is about $4 trillion. And then, as we mentioned uh, earlier, the uh, banks with those reserves, the banks can uh, create checking account balances by extending uh, loans to customers. And then, of course, they create checking account balances just as a regular part of their business. Um, And then uh, so the money supply would be uh, adding in those those claims to money or checking account balances along with the currency. Uh, 
to get, uh, say, a money uh, aggregate of M1? Well, a lot of people say that increasing commercial bank reserves does not create inflationary pressure because, as you mentioned, those reserves stay within the commercial banks themselves. They're not let out. They're used as a reserve against checking demands. Uh, would you disagree that, I guess we've more than quadrupled the monetary base, would you disagree that this $2.5 trillion of new bank reserves is going to, to, to have an inflationary effect ultimately? Right. It certainly will if uh, banks go back to their normal uh, lending practices and um, reduce their uh, reserve holding to, say, uh, a fraction of just maybe, say, 10%. Um, then this would involve a, a, a quite enormous uh, expansion of their checking account balances through credit uh, creation. Uh, right now, they're holding uh, pretty close to 200% reserve. And historically, that's higher than usual. Uh, the only time it's ever been uh, at this level, uh, anything near this level, was during the Great Depression. But isn't this interesting, though, that this attempt to stimulate the economy by creating bank reserves, it doesn't force banks to lend. If there's not credit-worthy borrowers or projects out there, then it, it, in effect, you're risking uh, in inflation without necessarily stimulating the economy here and now. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's um, Back in the 1930s, um, the opponents of this kind of policy that the Fed was had adopted back then uh, likened it to pushing on a string so the Fed, of course, can create all these bank reserves at once. But as you say, uh, this doesn't uh, necessarily create demand for credit, uh, you know, worthy projects for uh, banks to uh, lend into or for entrepreneurs to undertake. And so we have a repetition, just like we did in the Great Depression, of a suppression of uh, business investment uh, because of the tremendous uncertainty that exists in this uh, particular uh, economy. So we're talking about the supply of money and this, the shorter version of that, the monetary base. So that's sort of one side of the coin here. But the other side of the coin is the cost of money. Can you explain for us, uh, first and foremost, the the concept and the idea behind the federal funds rate? Sure. The federal funds rate is the interest rate that banks charge um, to other banks when they engage in interbank overnight lending. Basically, this is the lending that one bank would do to another bank uh, of the reserves that that bank holds. And the main reason for lending reserves in this manner is, uh, again, uh, to meet regulations. <clears throat> so that that's the Fed funds market. And uh, this market, of course, by lending, moving reserves around to banks that uh, could use them to uh, parlay loans, would... Uh, maximize really the, in normal times, the extent to which uh, checking account uh, uh, money substitutes could be created on the basis of these reserves. But the irony is that the, the banks aren't lending overnight to each other because there's not a robust lending market. They, they, they'd like to be out there making money by lending it, but they, they in other words, uh, part of the reason behind uh, the statutory creation of a small interest rate payment from the Fed uh, to commercial banks themselves on their holdings, currently uh, half of a basis point or half of a percentage point, um, was because if not, the overnight rate might drop even negative because the bank simply, there was no demand between the banks. So it doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Again, it's, uh, it's very similar to uh, the situation of the Great Depression, where the banks simply uh, don't have a large number of viable customers to lend to. The demand side for loans has uh, collapsed, and uh, the banks also, uh, just like uh, businesses, want to uh, move to liquidity in times of uncertainty. And so it uh, is a reasonable strategy for them to just hold hold the reserves and get paid uh, half a percent of interest as opposed to starting this process of normal commercial lending again. Well, the other point is that half point is also risk-free. It, it, it's a sure bet, courtesy of Congress. Uh, as opposed to, to lending risk. Um, you know, it, when it comes to the federal funds rate, obviously that is an interest rate that affects other interest rates throughout the economy that we all pay for a mortgage or a car loan, whatever it might be. David Stockman uh, calls the federal funds rate the most important price in the economy. Can you talk about uh, 
how Austrians view interest rates that they ought to be seen as prices, and can you give us maybe a, a short uh, exposition of, of the time preference theory of interest? Sure. So this is the idea that our saving that we're willing to uh, engage in to provide uh, the funds for lending uh, come from our uh, desire to uh, balance intertemporally uh, the satisfaction that we can have from making purchases sooner as opposed to later. So the person uh, is inclined to delay the satisfaction of, uh, let's say, uh, buying something for $1,000, uh, they'd be willing to save and lend out on interest uh, that $1,000 to someone else who has a more urgent uh, present need. And it's that uh, sort of uh, interplay between people with, as we say, lower time preference and people with higher time preference come into the market, into the loanable funds market, and uh, contract with each other to uh, lend and borrow. And so just like in any other market, the, the interest rate is the price that uh, clears this market, and it would be set in uh, without government interference, uh, just like any other price, uh, to reflect the uh, preferences that people have in this market. But isn't it astonishing, if you just step back and think about it conceptually, that people, mainstream economists by and large view interest rates as some sort of policy tool. They don't view it as a as a price or a meeting of in the marketplace between lenders and borrowers. Yeah, it's astonishing, and it, uh, it might harken back to the uh, point we made earlier about how mainstream economists see uh, the economy overall and the aggregate. So they think that every um, production activity in the economy is stimulated by aggregate demand. And so lower interest rates, in their view, would always uh, elicit more uh, spending and therefore have a positive stimulus effect on the economy. Well, so we talk about how the Federal Reserve distorts the supply uh, of money through creating bank reserves and increasing the monetary base. We can talk about how the Federal Reserve, in effect, distorts interest rates, the price of money, by manipulating the Fed funds rate or targeting the Fed funds rate. Um, so we take what Austrians would call two types of distortions. And can you talk about you know, how these distortions affect the production process? There's a, obviously Austrian business cycle theory says that this is a harmful thing. Uh, could you give us sort of a quick version of Austrian business cycle theory? Again, this uh, harkens back to the way that the Austrians view the economy uh, realistically. So we see the economy as a structure of capital production. So to take the housing uh, bubble as an example of this, in order to build more houses, we first have to uh, cut more trees down in the forest and then mill more lumber and we have to uh, you know, mine more uh, materials, uh, let's say iron out of the ground to produce more nails and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so once there's an expansion of credit that creates this artificial demand for some particular uh, product in the economy, it sets in motion a reallocation of investment towards the these earlier stages of production, as we would say, towards the extraction of raw materials, and the building up of the capital capacity to produce the intermediate goods like the nails and um, two by fours and so on and so forth uh, to eventually produce the greater um, demanded uh, result in more houses and more cars and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the problem uh, with all of this uh, reallocation uh, of resources in the economy is that it isn't uh, called forth by a change in people's uh, time preferences. It isn't that people are willing to uh, save more now so that they can have more products in the future uh, to release resources into the uh, expansion of these uh, capital production processes throughout the economy. Uh, quite the contrary, uh, people's uh, time preferences haven't changed. Uh, in fact, if anything, they've intensified during the boom their demand for consumer goods right now. And so the resources in the economy get pulled in two directions uh, that aren't consistent with one another. Uh, they get pulled toward the production of consumer goods, and they get pulled simultaneously toward the production of uh, mining and uh, building up capital capacity and so on and so forth. So there's really a resource constraint that doesn't allow both these things to be built up simultaneously. 
that eventually brings the uh, boom to an end and uh, requires then a period of a reallocation of the resources into their best use uh, that's consistent with people's preferences. But the reallocation is not always so easy, is it, right? I mean, if a, if a factory tooled up to make Cadillac Escalades, uh, because in an artificial credit and money market, there was a demand for these really fancy $80,000 SUVs. And then it turns out that that demand is short-lived even in a, an artificially propped up economy. It, it, it's not always a simple matter uh, to, to shift to building uh, little electric cars because there's a lot of sunk costs in a certain kind of assembly line. So it's, it, there's a time lag. I mean, there's, there's real harm here that, that, I mean, do you sense that we don't always understand this? Right, especially conventional economists. They think of the capital stock in the economy as uh, Play-Doh that can be, just be remolded at will into any uh, configuration that we need. Uh, you know, we could take an auto factory that we over-invested in during the uh, a boom and just uh, refashion it immediately into a washing machine factory or something else. But as you point out, the, um, the, uh, there's a degree of specificity that's created in the uh, boom in producing these capital goods. You have a lumber mill that you produce, and you can't just, uh, without cost, uh, uh, tear it down and reallocate the resources into uh, other uses that are now being demanded in, uh, relatively more highly. Well, talk about how you know cheap credit, or when we say cheap, we mean cheaper than it otherwise would be. It affects business decisions. In other words, it makes certain projects work on paper that wouldn't work in, in with what we would call a more natural rate of interest. And, and what does it mean to lengthen or shorten the, the structure of production? That's right. So the uh, when the Fed engages in this uh, monetary expansion through, through the uh, increased supply of credit in the banking system, then interest rates are suppressed. And the lowering of interest rates then creates uh, a greater present value for uh, heavier, more heavily uh, invested capital projects uh, than otherwise. And so we, we, we see asset price inflation, as we like to call it, uh, along the lines of particularly capital-intensive production processes. And these tend to be the ones that where demand is shifting uh, relatively towards those things. So again, to take um, automobiles as another example, it's one thing to increase the demand for automobiles, and this translates then to uh, increased demand for iron out of an iron mine. But uh, during the boom, not only do you get that increase in demand, but you get an increase in demand for iron from all the other sources that uh, iron is used for, iron rock fences for fancier houses and so on and so forth. So there's a certain concentration of uh, increased demand and therefore higher prices for the assets in production of um, uh, assets held, uh, capital stock held in the higher stages. And that is the process of lengthening out the capital structure. When resources move from uh, more direct production processes like uh, uh, labor and materials going into producing a car to more indirect production processes like labor and materials going into mining iron, which then produces steel, which then produces eventually a car. Well. Jeff, you know, despite these distortions, there are people who benefit, right? Uh, can you talk a little bit about how, unlike helicopter money, which is the joke that Ben Bernanke uh, famously uh, said we could dump money out of helicopters, well, that would be distributed somewhat evenly uh, across people and across the economy, but that's not how things happen with the Fed. Can you talk about the importance of primary dealers and how they're, the, uh, and help us understand the concept of earlier recipients of new money? Sure. So uh, we'll start with the latter point because uh, it's, I think, more basic. So when the Fed uh, inflates the money supply and they use it to buy something, then, of course, the first recipients, the ones who receive this new money first in the social process, um, benefit the most. They get wealth transferred to them because they're able to buy the goods that they want to buy with this new money before prices are bid up generally. But people will eventually receive this new money uh, after a long time of uh, the social process of spending and earning income and respending and so on. And uh, they'll get the new money when prices are already bid up. And uh, so they uh, have their wealth reduced. 
Now, the primary dealers are uh, first in line in this process of money creation. So they are the ones that the Fed uh, buys securities from or sells securities to um, as they start this process of monetary inflation and credit expansion. So for folks who aren't familiar, I mean, primary dealers are actual banks or security brokers that that are, are authorized to deal directly with the Fed um, it, itself. So, th- so in a sense, um, you know, the, these name the names of these primary dealers are available. So it's it's a uh, if it's cronyism, it's not hidden per se. Yeah, that's right. So uh, they're they're the big uh, banking houses, security houses, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo. Um, there are several um, foreign-held companies that are on the list. I think it right now is at 15 or 20, something like that. So UBS is on the list, list Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, and so on. Well, you know, ladies and gentlemen, for I'm sit- I'm actually sitting in a hotel in Las Vegas as we record this, and and this area is called Lake Las Vegas in Henderson, and it is really an unbelievably stark example of what we're talking about, Dr. Herbner, because this this rivals any Chinese ghost city. I mean, there are huge unfinished buildings out here. There's a casino that had begun to operate before the 08 crash, which now sits empty with weeds growing up around it. There are co- empty condominiums, empty storefronts, empty restaurants. Um, the Westin Resort I'm sitting in is half empty. And, of course, we're very, very far from the Las Vegas Strip here, um, which is kind of an analogy for people who are far from the D.C. money machine, right? Uh, and, and it really is uh, it really is a stark example of what this Lake Las Vegas community seemed feasible uh, at one point in one credit environment in, when the economy was, was – was such as it was in the the first half of the 2000s, and now um, we're sitting on these uh, on these these empty buildings, and it's really quite a quite a uh, a sad spectacle to see this beautiful resort so empty. There's a, an, an eeriness to us. And, and Jeff, if you would just to to, to close us out here, I mean, can you talk about this? This is always a problem for Austrians we, because of Bastiat's idea of the seen and the unseen. In other words, it's easy to see the skyscraper that goes up in an artificial interest rate environment and say, gee whiz, look at that. That's a tangible uh, um, economic benefit uh, to what the Fed is doing or what Congress is doing. But what's not so easy to see is, is the opportunity cost or, or the lost opportunity to use money elsewhere. That's, uh, that's always a perennial problem for us as economists is to wake people up to this, uh, this fact. It's a little bit easier with the business cycle, though, since uh, we do see the liquidation process. Uh, even though people have sometimes a hard time connecting the two, um, at least that is something tangible that they can look at uh, as you are surveying uh, Vegas at the moment, that, uh, you know, something has gone uh, terribly wrong. And uh, it is possible uh, through good economic analysis to wake people up to the a connection between the boom and then the following, uh, the following liquidation process. It also strikes me as an excellent example, the, the uh, malinvestment in Vegas, is an excellent example of why the Fed's policy of reflation doesn't work, because now we we see that when they uh, have reinflated uh, the economy and the housing boom has started over, it hasn't reinvigorated uh, Vegas. It's just uh, created malinvestment in San Francisco. Yeah, no, it's 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 a real tragedy out here. So, Dr. Herbner, we we thank you so much for your time this weekend, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to post a link to a really interesting out-of-date publication but from the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago itself that explains Fed money mechanics. And I've sent this around, and really even quite a few economists haven't seen it. So I really recommend if you want to, if we want to be adequate critics of central banking, the Fed, we really have to understand what it's doing and how it operates. So I'm going to recommend that to you. And of course, Jeff, there's a there's a million books that people could read on this. If you go to Mises.org, uh, I'm going to throw out Rothbard's Mystery of Banking. Of course, Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money. And if you want a treatment that reads just as well today as when it was written more than 100 years ago, you can read Mies, Ludwig von Mises' Theory of Money and Credit. I was skimming that the other day, uh, and there are paragraphs in that that, that sound like a, a Fed meeting today. I mean, they're they're so on point. Um, and people may not be familiar with it, but Dr. Herbner uh, uh, edited a book called The Pure Time Theory of Interest, which features Israel Kurzer and Roger Garrison, Frank Fetter. So, so that's also a book I would recommend to people who are – who are interested in really understanding what interest rates ought to be. Dr. Herbner, as we leave you, are there any particular 
book, books or articles that stand out to you that we might recommend to people? Uh, also, a little more advanced is uh, Joe Salerno's book on uh, money sound and unsound. Also excellent uh, work. Well, Jeff, we really appreciate your time. Ladies and gentlemen, check out Mises.org and have a great weekend. Thanks so much. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. And follow Jeff on Twitter via at Jeff Deist and at Mises.